when I saw it in the cinema, it was actually quite emotional, not because of the movie in itself, but because it was such a big arc, right? From watching the movies and the prequel trilogy, trilogy and now being part of, of the end. And then Star Wars uh, Skywalker saga is done. That was almost emotional. And uh, they really pushed that into the making of. If you watch the, the Blu-ray making of, it's, it's, it's like an end of an era. And uh, they, they get this point across really well. My guest today is Karl Schröter. He is a senior compositor at DNEC and worked previously five years for Industrial Light and Magic on Star Wars 8, 9, Solo, A Star Wars Story and The Mandalorian. Together we talk about his dream of working on Star Wars and how he achieved that, his time at Industrial Light and Magic and what it means to be a professional compositor in visual effects. You are listening to The 21 Artist Show, a podcast that inspires creatives to make meaningful content to pursue their passion. I'm talking with creators, artists and engineers about their careers, lessons they have learned and how to make an impact. I'm your host Alexander Richter, I'm a technical director and coach in visual effects, animation and games. For more content, go to 21artistshow.com. Enjoy the show. Hi and welcome. I'm happy to have you on the show, Carl. Thanks for having me, Alex. Pleasure to be here. We both, we know each other from our time at the Film Academy. That's where we basically met and we worked also in a way together there. Um, I'm curious, first and foremost, what happened afterwards? How, how did your career evolve after the Film Academy? After graduating, I made the jump to London from Germany and started as a mid-level compositor at uh, DNEC in uh, London. Uh, worked on a couple shows and transitioned to ILM in Vancouver. So I moved again, this time over the pond and ended up in Vancouver, beautiful Vancouver with all the beaches and mountains and stuff. And uh, spent uh, almost four and a half, five years at, at ILM before now just recently I switched back to DNEC, but this time in Vancouver as well. That's amazing. And one of the things that uh, like the topic of today is, is uh, we want to talk about Star Wars, which at the end of the day, ILM and Star Wars is kind of a thing, is a pact basically. And um, I know even before I know that you were like a big f fan of Star Wars. So it was no, no surprise for me when I saw like through LinkedIn that you actually are working on Star Wars. So before we dive into the, the details of that, because I'm, I'm curious as like how it is to work on it and like what it means for, for you. I think the first thing I'm always curious if, you, if I see something like that, that because I know that you wanted to work on such a project like Star Wars. And I'm curious is like where this fascination and passion about Star Wars came from. I was super young when Jurassic Park released. I was right in my dinosaur phase. I was probably like five years old. And uh, I obviously wasn't allowed to see it in the cinema, but uh, one day my parents brought home the VHS. I'm, I'm that old, yes, uh, of uh, Jurassic Park. And I made it to the opening scene, just literally like five minutes in before it was too scary, too much, and uh, I, I had to stop watching. The day after that, my dad brought me um, the making of book. We went to a shop and he, he bought me the book showing how it was all done, the miniatures, the VFX, and that it wasn't real, dinosaurs don't exist anymore. And I was hooked, I was fascinated. And there's people doing this for a living, like building things that don't exist and, and scaring little children. And from that point on in time, I, I wanted to do the same. So Jurassic Park and dinosaurs basically got me into the whole VFX thing. How old were you when you when you got hooked on that? Maybe four or five, I would say. Oh yeah, okay. So pretty pretty early on. And um, 
Yeah, in my, my teenage years, I was big into computer games and uh, technology, right? I was building levels for, for Unreal and Counter-Strike and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually a thing a lot of people in our generation like did in some capacities because everyone was kind of playing Unreal Tournament and, and all this jazz. Counter-Strike was yeah. a big thing. And uh, I, I, hear, I hear this story a lot that some people were starting their career with actually level building as you did. It was a fun time back then right if you you got the tools basically the, the first time i really learned what three dimensions are and interacting with cubes and building hallways and stuff and you could walk around in them and it, it was it was really really something and yeah this led me to wanting to do something tech and computer related for for a job and right about that time the Star Wars prequel trilogy kicked off in the cinemas, right? And I remember that episode one was the first movie I saw twice in the cinema. I convinced my dad again to, to see it again, basically immediately after we saw it, maybe one day after, so we went back to watch it again. And yeah, I, I saw the old, uh, the original trilogy before and was already interested and that really cemented the the wish to do that kind of stuff. And um, one thing led to another and I applied for a couple of internships after my, my A-levels. And I got one in a tiny games company in Berlin, but I really wanted to VFX and they had the VFX branch. So I bugged my, my boss, my supervisor, like for a week that I wanted to transition from doing a pony game, what they were working on at the time. <laughs> my, to, my Little uh, Pony? Is something that like that. You, could, okay. you were able to uh, to groom and, and shave like farm animals and stuff. Yeah, that's a big thing in Germany. It's like this whole farm simulator and this pet simulate. I think we love simulation of life kind of or work. <laughs> yeah. Germans can't get enough of work, so we simulate work. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it worked out. I, I was annoying enough that he said, okay, well, uh, we give it a try. You got um, two weeks and transition to the other office and do some, some VFX stuff. So I was pretty new to all this. I played around with Fusion at the time and had to learn Shake for, for that job. But it... It somehow all worked out. Uh, I, I did good and they kept me on as a digital artist. So I was doing some 3D and some compositing and slowly transitioning into compositing only at the company. Um, but I always wanted to uh, get, a, get a diploma, right? Get a, get a proof that I learned something, that I know what I'm doing. It's, it's also maybe a German thing. I don't know, but. Yeah, we, we already talked, like I talked with Sabina. She, is, she was like 12 years at Blue Sky Studios and she also like. He did ask if I would stay at the company, but you know, I, I guess that's maybe just me, but I, I was like, nope, education first has to be finished. She did an internship and then she came back just to finish her education because it is kind of like a fundamental thing where you feel like okay, you feel you're missing like the basics if you if you or you need the paper. I don't know. Sometimes in, in this category. Yeah, it's it's a big deal. I mean, if, for the parents, for yourself, for <laughs> uh, the government, right, You for your pension fund and for your visas and stuff. You feel like you, you have like a chance if you're if it, if it doesn't work out, you know, I feel that that's what it feels like. It's like if things are not, doesn't work out, this kind of path of independent VFX something, you will still have something in your hands and you can do like a, a more boring and normal job. I think it, this is a little bit also the safety net, basically. Yeah, for sure. And um, so I applied at a couple of different universities and uh, Film Academy was one of them and probably my favorite, right? I wanted to, I wanted to go to Film Academy. And I got rejected. I did my, so I applied, I was invited to do the test. Uh, I did the test back at home. So I drove like five hours from my home to the school to get the, the uh, task to do. And I drove back, did it for 72 hours is the time frame you got. And then drove back to the school to hand it in. And 
it they didn't like it i didn't like it as well and it's probably because a lot of people tried to help me out so i had tons of input and it was probably just diluting and bordering down what i had in mind and so they they had a point in not accepting me but i i wasn't taking it so i went back to my former job the where i did the internship they hired me again for a year and after another year of of working i applied again the next year at film academy and the second time around it did work but i only did one shot one compositing shot and nobody said anything <laughs> i could basically do what i wanted my parents let me work and yeah it, i got in and i was was super happy and super lucky because the selection process is quite hard the, the groups of students i accept are pretty small so um, that was the next big step in my career to finally get into the program so what was your your initial idea of going to the film academy what do you want to get out of this um it's it's Hard to say. I, all, I always knew that it's a great school and they give you a lot of opportunities, but I wasn't really sure what this entails, right? And uh, it turned out that you learn a ton from your co-students, right? From your from your friends and the people you sit in the same room with. And you also obviously learn something from the, the teachers and educators, but it's it's just part of the deal. And The projects you do, you do a couple big set pieces projects, right? Um, that's the, the main calling card. And um, what is, so with all the, the rendering power and workstations and camera equipment, and most importantly, the other students that not uh, are focused on VFX, but they focus on directing, camera work, sound design, right? All of this talent comes together to create stuff. And my third year project was selected as the main trailer for FMX, which is a pretty big deal and a computer, computer graphics conference in Europe. The Film Academy is co-hosting the event so we had the chance to not only participate but to create material for for the conference and our piece was selected to be screened in front of every talk in front of every showcase it was on the bags on the banners on the lanyards it was everywhere so it was a ton of exposure we got out of this yeah i think i think everyone who was who was at, at this fmx specifically at Or, or who has basically on each uh, FMX remembers the trailer. I think that's something that that is keeps keeps in your mind forever because, you, as you mentioned, it is everywhere. It is you see it so often. You get spammed basically with that until you you, you are fed up with it. But I I I, I remember yours uh, specifically, the rugby box. It was uh, still I feel like one of the best uh, FMX trailer I've ever seen, and also I feel like one wow. of the best projects. <laughs> Um, I feel because it, it feels so complete. It is short, um, but it feels to the point and the story is very clear. It's a very simple story, but it feels so um, so rounded. And uh, if you think about this is like a student project, I mean, uh, some people say we're cheating if the film academy is, is still called a uh, university or the students there are still called students. But um, I feel like this is this project um was feels like the most rounded and and I, what i what i noticed later was basically that not everything was cg in there and that was some something i was surprised because i was expecting it as like a cg trailer so you expect everything is cg but then i i like i think even you told me because we were in the same room um and that parts of it were real and i was like <laughs> uh first of all thanks for for all the nice words uh i i see a lot of problems in this project but uh, I'm glad you, liked <laughs> you have it. a different eye for that for sure yeah it's it's a combination of mostly cg characters and cg and real environments so we we built some miniature sets we went into the woods and got like moss and logs and branches and stuff and tried to build our environment to film in that was a huge compositing task right so it was right up my alley and i probably was pushing a bit in this direction as well to give it the edge and knowing that people thought it would be all 
computer generated. That's uh, I think we reached our goal there, right? It's great that it blends together so well. Yeah, and what I what I like also about the project in reverse, if you understand uh, that this is like partially real, I like this part that um, you you use everything. Because that's what I, sp I have a problem with with it uh, at the moment. I also uh, watched like Hugo Garris uh, VFX notes. So he's talking about like uh, basically he, they watch movies and then they kind of criticize that and uh, give it a little bit of like their perspective as a VFX supervisor. And he one thing that he always says: don't overdo it. You know, like you don't have to do everything in the volume or everything in CG, everything in blue screen. If you can do it real go there and 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 record there and what i really liked about this project and i feel like this is the the quick essential is like whatever you can do real why shouldn't you because at the end of the day i'm pretty sure you at first one i'm probably pretty sure you would never get the quality of real uh, on this with this time frame and like at this time um and also is like the time that you would invest to create this fauna and flora with the waterfall and whatever i think it would be 10 times the time that you needed to actually just create it in real life. And you also had specialists for that as far as, I think it's, there were set dressers also involved into this project. We had uh, one set designer, yeah. And uh, you're completely right. It would be a huge undertaking to do all this uh, like from scratch, right? To build every leaf and every branch and every twig. But uh, if you can get it for free, why? Why not use that, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, totally. But it it opens up a whole other can of worms, right? You you have the whole integration part that you get for free from C, not for free, but it, it's easier in CG when everything layers correctly and lines up, and you have the shadows and everything. But yeah, it uh, for the time it was definitely the right idea, and um, we we had a ton of fun. Uh, I still have some time-lapse footage of us building the set and definitely want to see that one because i, <laughs> I really i really like to, to throw that in it's like i i love making offs in a more of you know not just like layers but uh really like seeing how things are made i really love that kind of things it's it's not the the best footage but i can probably get it to you that would be cool <laughs> it continues because the praise didn't st uh, end with the fmx Basically, so you also uh, were, had won the VS award at, uh, this year too. Then yes, a couple months after we so the Film Academy uh, enters uh, quite a lot of student projects into the into the race for outstanding visual effects in a student project. That's what the category is called. And yeah, we got we got a call. I think that uh, we won and. It's, it's special for the student category that they tell you beforehand. So they give you the opportunity to travel there because otherwise the student wouldn't show up, right? Just because. It is also very expensive, the whole thing, you know, like trip to <laughs> LA and all this stuff as a student specifically. But uh, we had a we had a fantastic time. So we, we flew over. I was already in London at the time. And um, a couple of friends actually were in Santa Monica, though they had the shortest travel distance <laughs> you could possibly imagine but we met up uh, in the beverly hilton it was if i remember correctly and uh, participated in the ceremony right and you had all the who is who of the vfx industry you had the, your ilm table and your weather table and the frame store guys were there and so many uh, important people and such talent in this room and yeah uh, the night before we uh, we drew draw straws, uh, who was the one who needed to speak, right? Because nobody <laughs> really wanted to step up <laughs> and and say say some words, do the speech, and um, so we made it a game. And I was uh, the lucky one and didn't have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was another huge thing. So. Especially for, for your resume, right? You, you won an VES award uh, and as a student, that's, that's a big deal. But overall, to be absolutely honest, it didn't really do much in my career later on. So it's, it's still a line on my CV and that's great. The, the trophy is at the Film Academy, so nobody can display it on that's the coffee table. That's why it's not behind you, like, you know, like oh, the yeah, YouTube it's, button, it's you, right you would have like a VS <laughs> button there. It's nice to have, but it's definitely not uh, a deal breaker or you 
you're getting your dream job just just because of that. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that because I have one too uh, for Breaking Point. Um, and um, I wouldn't, it's the same thing. And I, I really appreciate that you say that because some people always think like if you win an award or some awards, suddenly you get jobs everywhere or opportunities everywhere. And I don't feel like the award, especially in our industry, is as important as the project that you were actually connected to, you know, if you were connected to, I was always working on Star Wars, Guardians of Galaxy, whatever. Um, I think it's it's like 10 times more important than uh, you won an, an award uh, somewhere, even if it's a big award, like the VS award. Uh, I feel like it is not the same. It's not as important for your career. And uh, I mean, for yourself, the festival is nice. The, the whole gala is super nice, mm -hmm. but I mean, the rest it's like you, you don't you don't even have it and you're not really kind of like you have it's like a line in your cv as you just said i mean it definitely helps right but it's not it's not the, the do you say that every draw. time if you're re recruiting is like by the way i have a vs award guys so it would be good to have it on the wall right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it would be cool like every time you come to a, like an interview or you have it like or yeah or, like i mean now as it's online you put it just behind you you know not so blurry just just you can see it basically and you're like you you feel it <laughs> you, you can you can see it so in the background it's like hmm. i remember the food looked amazing at the gala event right but it wasn't super tasty. That's another weird memory that just came to mind, right? I was impressed <laughs> impressed when I saw it, but it's, uh, it's more for show. At the FMX uh, conference, I met some guys from Framestore, some, some supervisors, and the Film Academy gives you the opportunity to be a student guide, right? For the speakers, they invite to Germany. Most of them don't speak German or have never been to FMX, so they get a student um, to show them around and help them out from time to time. And I uh, picked some some soups from Framestore. And during the event, we, we talked a bit and they asked me one time, so what's coming next? What's up for you uh, after, after the conference? And I said, well, so we have this gap year where we are allowed to work and gain more experience before returning to school and finish our studies. And I applied at a bunch of companies, but I didn't hear back from any of them. So that's a bit sad. And they said, did you apply to Framestore as well? And I said, yes, I did. And they said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, let us check on that. <laughs> and lo and behold, uh, a week later or something, I got uh, an interview invitation and I was selected as one of the summer interns for Framestore commercials in 2013, I think it was. So that was my first period I spent in London uh, at Framestore and was amazing. So after the internship, they kept me on as a junior compositor and I worked on a couple cool commercials ranging from Audi to like National Geographic and uh, Nike and, and stuff like that. So pretty, pretty sweet stuff, especially for a student. It allowed me to build a portfolio super quickly. Commercial projects are mostly short, right? And they're pretty high profile. So I got some, some nice shots out of that in a, in a particularly short amount of time. But commercials wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to do feature films and, and VFX for movies and cinemas. And I wanted to see my name on the big screen. So <laughs> I made the uh, hard decision to, to leave frame store commercials and um, have a very short period, I think it was just one or two months at Messet Studios in London, working on Jupiter Ascending. That was my first Hollywood feature VFX movie I worked on. And yeah, it was so short because the movie was wrapping up, but also I needed to return to the film academy. The year was over and I needed to go back to finish my studies. And Another tough decision was that they wanted to keep me. They said, you don't need to go back and finish your studies. You can stay here. You have a job. You work in VFX. And, and so why go back? And um, as we talked about earlier, having your education and having the certificate and everything is a really big deal in Germany. So I said, no, I need to go back. I need to 
put a check mark on on my studies right i can tell you i will throw the the clip from sabina here at the same moment because nope. education first has to be finished. exactly the same situation 100 <laughs> percent the same the same result basically <laughs> i think that applies to a lot of people at least a couple of them. It, it is a cultural thing. I think there is a like things that that you personally, of course, you know, like you you have your decision of I don't want to do commercials. I want visual effects. That's your personal thing. But I feel like things like education or what you value. I mean, Americans have the American dream and stuff like that. So I feel like there is a specific cultural thing going on I, but I, I love that because it's one-on-one -on -one, the exact situation she had <laughs> she was working there one year and then they offered her a continuation and she said nope education <laughs> I'm going uh, so, back. so <laughs> I go back before I finish and then I come maybe back and do and continue basically so what happened afterwards I finished my studies um, after your gap year it's basically um, only your diploma project that's left, right? So we started out doing a trailer for a fantasy movie thing, Lord of the Rings or something, right? We wanted horses and swords and, and the dragon. Um, so we spent some time on that project, which sadly didn't work out for a couple of reasons. And uh, then we had to switch gears pretty quickly because the school was like breathing down our backs and said, you have to get something done before your graduation. So we switched over to a commercial, right? We all of us had some commercial experience and we thought, well, it would be fun to do a beer commercial. So <laughs> we, we had a cool concept and the director that was interested and we produced a beer commercial for a local beer in Iceland. I remember that actually. I, I, I'm curious, just by the way, is like, uh, did they support the project at the end? Because I remember you were talking with them about the whole thing. So they were super excited, but they didn't. Um, they didn't buy the finished piece of of commercial, right? Uh, and that's it. Wasn't 100 our call. The the film academy owns the rights, right, yes. to to the student project. So they were involved as well and had a certain amount of demands and the the company wanted distribution rights and something. So it didn't work out in the end as well, but they have been super excited about it. And they sent us a gift package and invited us over. Uh, if we are in Iceland next time, we can drop by. And the audience can, can guess what kind of gift package they probably sent here. So. <laughs> <laughs> because I remember show. I was in the room, by the way, I was in the <laughs> same room when, and saw the gift package. The trip to Iceland was, was amazing. I fell yeah. in love with Iceland. I think I've been there three times by now and I'm going back this year again. So if you haven't been to Iceland, check it out. It's, it's an amazing country. I saw the footage and there's a trailer online. It probably is, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because then I then I will blend it in, and because uh, I remember how you worked on it, and uh, I think there were drone footage and mm. and a lot of things, and it looks. I think it was it was a fantastic project again. Again, I have to say, right, if we hadn't spent all the time on the fantasy trailer thing, right, it would be even better, because uh, we we cut our our time in half basically. We, we had for working on the diploma project. Which made it more realistic for a commercial at the end of the day. From <laughs> oh, yeah. Like a, a time frame. It was like, how long did you work on that one? Maybe less than a year, I would say, yeah. from start to finish. The darkness. But yeah, so when the, when the client decides from doing a fantasy movie to a beer commercial, that actually is a realistic scenario. That can happen in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was my diploma project and um, we presented it at FMX again uh, the, the year after. And this was also the time when I had to make plans for what happens after my graduation. So I applied again at a couple of studios. I wanted to go back to London. You missed the 24 seven. Uh, the 24 seven shops. <laughs> yeah. And they all so much wanted my commute back, right? I missed the commute so much. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, so I applied at a couple uh, studios and uh, decided to go with DNEC at the time. So I joined DNEC as a, as a mid-level compositor on Star Trek 
Right. My flatmate at the time was a huge Trekkie. He was over the moon. But as we established earlier, I'm more of a Star Wars guy, right? I, I like Star Wars a lot more than Star Trek, so I was less th thrilled about it. And he couldn't understand. He goes, what? What's, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and I said, well, it's spaceships and uh, phasers, but it's not lightsabers. So. But it was another step in the right direction. Yeah, especially with J.J. Abrams in this case. Uh, uh, it was wasn't. It was uh, just... Oh, it was the third game. one, it wasn't it? Yeah. Beyond. Oh, yeah. But um, we get to a J.J. Abrams project. <laughs> we, we get to it. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, yeah, so after... Star Trek, I worked on um, Assassin's Creed, um, uh, a video game project, right? Most of you will, will probably know the franchise. I'm not sure if anyone saw the movie, to be honest. Is that is that something that you, you enjoyed yourself? Uh, I enjoyed it because I worked on it. It has okay, its okay. moments, right? Okay, it's, okay. It's... I, I never saw it, but it, it, it kind of didn't catch me in the trailer. I was like, uh, and then I saw the reviews and I was I'm not sure if that's. It's, uh, it's the I love curse. the games. I mean, the games are amazing. As depends on which one, but um, it's a it's a really cool game. But it's 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 sadly the 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 fate of a lot of games that will, are created into movies is basically their rarity that they are good. It's I, I basically I don't know even if I can say one. I mean, they're like Doom and all this, <laughs> this stuff. There there will be Uncharted. There will be a series Uncharted, which I'm curious about but when i saw the cast i'm not sure if that will be a thing but let's see don't you like tom holland <laughs> uh yeah what's the uh, mark Wahlberg? i think is the place plays the old uncle which is like 60 or something but he plays himself i think and i don't think he's 60 so i'm i'm, I'm curious let's let's say I'm, I'm 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 kind of we'll see about that because i know like um, the, the brand of Uncharted is super good and they know how to do cinematics basically so I'm curious if they can how much power they have in the final product but I agree so far video game Hollywood movies are kind of cursed right it's never really it's worked bit. out yeah at least not for the fame base I'm not sure for someone who has no, no like connection to the games if maybe some of them enjoy that I don't know but for the fans most of the time it's kind of not what I was expecting. Yeah, so uh, while working on Assassin's Creed, um, ILM started their Jedi Academy program, right? To bring in junior talent and, and get students and recent graduated graduates into the company. And my school, the Film Academy, put my name forward. So I and a couple of friends who were at London in London at the time who uh, were willing to go, joined ILM for like a recruiting event. And I was over the moon, obviously. I wanted to do Star Wars, so hell yeah, I, I attended. And I had an interview again. The recruiter know me by by then, right? I was in contact a couple times before and he said, hey, Carl, it's, it's you again. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Does it mean you applied before uh, or how did you build up this, this kind of connection? So I applied even before uh, going to Film Academy, right? When I was during the internship, I applied the first time and got a got the expected answer, a very polite email saying- Thank you very uh, much, but please next time kind of. Yeah, not, not now, but uh, work on your skills and we can talk in the future. And then during all the FMXs we've been to, ILM basically has a recruiting booth every time. So I talk to them at the conferences and since London is the closest office, they most of the time send people from the London office. So I know that recruiter in particular. And uh, in London, you've been there as well. You know, the pub culture, right? People hang out yes, after work totally. and for a beer. So it, it was unavoidable that you bump into ILM people from time to time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to be there. So obviously I bought a beer here and there and tried to, to talk my way into the company. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, guys, that, this is how you do it. You, you, if you cannot find a job, go to London, live there for a month, uh, go to every pub you can find, search for, especially there's like a pub, uh, as, you, as we both know, there's a pub for basically for each company. 
there's this ILM pub, there's a frame store pub, there's an NPC pub where you can find most of the people there. Uh, mostly closed, the closest to the company itself. Uh, um, I know like BrewDog was for the commercial of frame store was, was a big thing. And, but yeah, just, just do that. I think you, you probably get, get 10, 10 steps ahead compared to online application. At least you get to know people, right? You, yes. You learn the names I mean, of course, and... when, when COVID is over, I feel this <laughs> is like the, the thing that is currently makes it impossible a little bit. Yeah. The Jedi Academy program. So they, uh, were super honest and I, I have high regards uh, for that. Um, they basically said, well, the Jedi Academy is for bringing in like super young and, and uh, people early in their career, young talent and people early in their career. So what we could offer you is a roto prep position, but we know you're a DNAC currently as a mid-level compositor. So that would be a step back for you. And, Honestly, uh, they advised me to not go for it. And that's that's something special, right? Most companies try to get the, the best talent as soon as they can for as low uh, of, a, of a salary as possible. So they could have definitely talked me into joining them, but they said, well... Just throw like Star Wars, like every second sentence is like, just, <laughs> you mean Star Wars is, is a good thing that you can work on Star Wars... And Maybe. Yeah. So was, <laughs> <laughs> don't um, you want to be a Jedi? I said, well, okay. And uh, I, I stayed at, at DNEC for the time being and um, worked on Dunkirk, right? The Christopher Nolan movie. That was another tick on my bucket list. And uh, Annihilation, um, which uh, was it's not my favorite. It's, it's had definitely is a stylish movie. It has some, some cool aspects to it, but I've found it not to be my kind of tea, my cup of tea. A couple months later, I applied again because I saw a compositing job opening, I think on LinkedIn or something from ILM. So I applied again to the London office and didn't hear back for like a week or two weeks. And then all of a sudden I got a reply from the Vancouver studio, ILM, which was a bit odd, but Hey, I wanted to do Star Wars and I knew that Vancouver was uh, a great city and was paying overtime. It was just not the case in London. So I made the jump. We, we um, went through the whole recruiting process. Everything looked awesome. And I moved from London to Vancouver. And a couple of days after I arrived here, I had my first day at Industrial Ladder Magic. Welcome to our short mid-episode coffee break. If you love the content and would like to have a successful career in the film or games industry yourself, check out my website 21artistshow.com. There you can find helpful articles, masterclasses and coaching opportunities that help dozens of my students to bring their profession to the next level. That's all. Check out 21artistshow.com and share the podcast with cool people you know. Let's continue with the episode. I arrived here with a, with a friend of mine who started probably a couple of days earlier, maybe a week earlier at ILM. So I, I knew someone, which was a big deal. So I had someone to talk to and we could share experiences and stuff. But I used my first couple of days to set up the bank account and get my apartment going and get the insurance cards and all that jazz. And then Monday came and I made my way to the office. It's a, it's a little bit hidden, so you have to know where it is. They probably don't want to advertise uh, Lucasfilm. Star Wars is made here and a big arrow pointing to the door. So, <laughs> <laughs> like on, on Google, you can see it. Google Maps, you can see then like a oh, yeah. lightsaber or something around that. <laughs> um, so you have to know where it is. And when I opened the door, the first thing you see is a life-size stormtrooper uh, mm -hmm. looking at you menacingly. And then there's the reception area. And I said, hey, well, I'm new here. It's my, it's my first day. And I was led into the kitchen where a couple of other new starters were waiting already. And then the first day was basically just paperwork and a tour of the studio, getting uh, to learn a lot of names. I'm super bad with names. So that was the hard part. 
And finally, they led you to your desk, right? Where you're sitting in your department. And the comp department is most of the time the darkest one because you need to see the correct colors. And um, so it was a bit like moody in the comp dungeon, um, but uh, it was, was cool stuff. And um, I know that Star Wars episode eight was going on at the time. And I was seeing it on some of the screens and I was crossing my finger, hoping and praying that I will be on Star Wars. But it turned out I was on a completely different show. I was on Only the Brave, uh, which is a firefighting movie based on true events. It's a great movie. Go watch it if you haven't seen it. It's really good. It's but currently it's on, on Netflix also. They kind of promote it at the moment. Nice. I didn't know. It's not not in Canada. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, in Spain, I don't know where that, where else it's. Uh, but yeah, just seek it out. It's it's a cool story, and it's probably as far removed from Star Wars as you could possibly be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so I I dove into that project, tried to do my best. I was still hyped to be at ILM, right? It was a huge step for me. And I spent all my free time, all the breaks, all the, the walks to the coffee machine and back to uh, talk to people and look at screens where Star Wars was happening, right? So it was pretty obvious that I wanted to be on Star Wars. And it was so obvious that my soup said, well, if you do a good job, I pull some strings and we get you onto a Star Wars show before your contract is over. I, I started out with a fairly short contract, so I, I wanted to to check it off the list because maybe they don't extend me and I have to go back to Germany and never worked in Star Wars. That was not going to happen. <laughs> um, so I did my best and um, the soup held his word and said, OK, um, so we putting you on episode eight for two weeks. And they said, what, only two weeks? Yeah, because I was scheduled to do another show afterwards and they extended me, so that was great. Um, but I had only the gap in between the two shows to, to work on Star Wars. And my very first Star Wars shot I ever did was the lightning strike hitting the Jedi tree where Yoda and Luke having the conversation. And it's a short shot and it's a dark shot but I made a dream of mine come true to work on Star Wars, be part of the franchise, right? Do something that, that I so much enjoyed for all of my life. And this felt awesome. That was a really, really big deal for me. Did you also get the credits there? Did you find yourself there? I think I am in the credits, yes. So even for two weeks, I, I earned, a, uh, earned a credit. One lightning, that's all you need. <laughs> that's to all do. it takes. <laughs> yes. It's lightning in a bottle. Um, I did uh, another one or two shots, um, but fairly small ones. So um, I tried to, to get as much done in the two weeks as I could. And the soup uh, on that show was super happy with me as well and said, hey, you did great. Uh, we wanted to keep you on till the end of the project, but you're scheduled to do something else. And right around that time, I learned what the something else was going to be. And it turned out to be um, Marvel Thor Ragnarok, which is a cool movie in itself, right? It's not Star Wars, but um, it was a fun project. It's, again, something totally different, right? We went from computer games, Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, something... Um, like World War II related and now doing Marvel. So I was really lucky with all the projects I was uh, able to work on. And I did some Hulk shots and I did some environment stuff and had a had a good time on, on Thor. And um, yeah, so during that time, I really got my footing at ILM, right? I learned all the names finally and uh, was part of the team. I also feel like like Thor Ragnarok is is, is uh, such a, I don't know how to say it, man, but I, I would say it's like, it's one of the most prestigious project at that time, I would say, because I mean, until that time, Thor was not the most 
the, the most interesting Marvel character. If the Thor one and two were okay. He was was nice in 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 the Avengers, but he was not as exciting as he became with uh, when uh, Taika Waititi basically took over and made it uh, like a fun entertaining marvel explosions color and oh yeah uh yeah. i mean the shots are amazing like the like just the framing it has this this kind of 300 framing where you feel like it could be like an oil painting in a way <laughs> uh which i i really really like and uh yeah so i feel like this was also uh for your career it sounds like that like something that pushed it up again i mean you were working on on amazing product like star trek and so on before but i feel like this one like a, a marvel project is always it is one of the highest uh movie regards at the moment i would say it's probably one of the biggest hollywood uh empires by now definitely yeah it, it's it was a fun movie it's super saturated right it's bright and vibrant and fun and it was something different to the more moody and, and dark and serious tone of star wars before that after that one was uh, my first Star Wars project I got to work on from the very beginning. And that's uh, my guy, Solo, A Star Wars Story. That was my first start to finish Star Wars project. And it's super cool because as a compositor in the very beginning, you don't have a ton of, of like deadlines, right? Because it's the pretty much... The, one of the last departments in the pipeline. So you were uh, involved in setting up scenes and defining looks and playing around, building tools. And I, I enjoy that part of my job really much because it's it's a bit more on the technical side, right? You, you're you writing code and building gizmos and, and working on the pipeline. And that's something totally different from making pretty pictures, but it's, it's equally important in, in my book. And yeah, we worked on uh, Mr. Solo himself and learned uh, why Hans' na last name is Solo and, and stuff like that. All the important important information that we're waiting for, basically, uh, <laughs> like the name. But um, I, I remember you told me before that you were working actually on this uh, Millennium Falcon scene. Yeah, at the end, when, when they're escaping the moor, the, the giant space creature, right? And... Uh, squeezing between the two uh, asteroids that are colliding that sequence. Kind of remember it was very moody and dark and there was like flashes of light. But you're not meaning the uh, the Th Thith Temple in episode 9. Ooh, that was, so. there, there's a lot of light. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's stuff. true. No, no, no. There, I remember there was, there was this, this warm thing or something that was chasing them or something like that yeah there's the space worm and early yes. on in the movie there's another worm coming out of like the little pond and stuff and they're still on Corellia. hey yeah, yeah. I, we need more names for these things i don't i don't know you have to rewatch it i have to rewatch it as well <laughs> <laughs> um, that's true so that was basically uh, how long did you work on that one <sighs> it's a tough question so i don't have the timeline but uh, from start to finish, which might have been half a year, eight months. Okay. Probably which is more long than... for compositing, isn't it? Like what's, what is the normal time frame for, for a compositing project of this scope normally for you? It, it depends. Most of the crew starts very late in the, in the process, right? When, when all the upstream departments have done a lot of the work, right? And you have really stuff to do, right? There's a lot yes. of CG and plates and, and stuff to, to actually composite together. Um, so that obviously shortens the time frame. But on Solo, I started, as I said, right in the, at the start uh, of the show. So it might have been a bit longer than usual. Um, but the normal time frame is still couple definitely couple of months six months something like that okay because I feel, I feel i find it quite interesting to also understand because like compositing is, is a very freelancing job compared to some other departments i mean a lot of them are freelancing but i'm coming more from a technical directing point of view and it is very like on the last as you said, it's basically the last part uh, of the of the project, and there's some some compositor from the beginning to create everything, to create the templates, set everything up. But I was also kind of curious for me is like how short is that actually the realistic part where they kind of ramp up to I don't know 
50, 100 compositors, and then uh, they work there for three months, six months, um, and then they probably, uh, so it's just also a little bit interesting to get a little bit of scope, because I feel like if you go into compositing, it's good to understand what is a kind of typical time frame of a project, because for example, as a technical director, I can be two years, three years on a project, uh, even like from the, like literally the first, like one of the first people basically on the project. Uh, but for compositors often, besides it's like the leads, end, right. uh, besides of leads, it's kind of, it's a lot of times so I feel like it's around three to six months. I mean, of course, depending on the project. Probably uh, a thing, uh, some, some people join just right at the end for crunch time, right? When they really get to uh, push things out the door, but um, we need more bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, uh, sometimes this feels like that, yeah. But um, I, I would say three to six months is a realistic time frame. Okay. And yeah, after after solo, um, the next thing on my list was uh, Bumblebee. Uh, Transformers, the first Transformers movie not done by Michael Bay. So I wanted to say, like, check for <laughs> for Transformers. I'm not sure if it was on your bucket list, but um, I mean, I enjoy the movies, right? For what they are, it's, yes. uh, they are spectacle, and uh, Michael Bay is the your guy for doing spectacle. They might not be the most coherent or or dramatically engaging movies but they're definitely a spectacle and uh, bumblebee was different it's not like your your typical transformer so i enjoyed that one as well um another bucket list uh, you could say and um after that one uh was aladdin so a, a, a disney disney project right but from guy pierce which was was a combination i was not expecting because i was like aladdin okay and then guy pierce is like snatch guy uh, is now doing, doing you mean that. Guy Ritchie right Guy Ritchie oh sorry yeah Guy, Guy, <laughs> Guy Ritchie yeah so I was like, Guy Pierce Guy Ritchie yeah Guy Pierce is an actor Guy Ritchie is a director yeah sure yeah exactly Guy, Guy Ritchie was just like okay this Aladdin Guy Ritchie that's a that's an odd combination uh, to be honest how was the project again something something totally different right most people don't realize that uh, the genie right is full CG it's not with Miss Painted Blue and then the torso is green screen a smoke no, or something like that it's, yeah it's a hundred percent full CG, which is crazy to think about um and yeah I, I was on that for quite a while as well um did some stuff with the lamp at the end when the jafar gets sucked into the lamp and um worked on the, the dissolving lamp and the smoke effects and stuff um, on uh, raja and the tiger which was uh, which is a great asset. I, I loved the asset, the grooming and the animation, and it looked so so good. Is there something like after this project already? Is there something which you felt um, was a tendency of something that a you liked and b you were were kind of positioned into? Like, was there something in compositing where you felt your 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 department was putting on you on, and you were you wanted to work on on specific compositing elements? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, over over my career, I did a lot of fire, <laughs> like burning, <laughs> I mean, yeah. burning things. Um, maybe maybe that's one. Uh, I really enjoy um, like environments, right? Vistas and, and stuff. But um, compositing them together, or what exactly? Yeah, um, like set extensions and and not doing from time to time I, I also do super detailed work right you have to a close up or the lamp shot for example where it's really close but I think I, I get more out of big wide shots where, where you can see more stuff happening um, but I wouldn't say that you get um, like put into a category and you only do that Maybe for some people that are super good for water, or maybe it's it's less of a compositing thing and more of a maybe an effects CD or an animation thing. Yeah, because that's what I feel like for 3D. Uh, it's definitely more true. I feel like there is this very kind of like, let's bring the water guy. And then like they open like five doors and then this guy comes out <laughs> and he works on it and goes back. Um, but I'm also curious for compositing because, um, I mean, maybe, maybe you're now the lighting guy, like after... 
after yeah. Star Wars. You're like every time we're like, okay, we have a lighting. Get get Carl. Bring, bring, get, <laughs> bring Carl. <laughs> No, but it's also curious because I'm 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 not so much into compositing. And for for me, it was curious. Like, a, um, do you build up a preference, like you personally, um, and b, um, do you get kind of casted into specific task because you are the guy for it, and uh, people want to like not just because of your preference, but also because you're like the best with fire composition or the best with set extension and stuff like that. But it doesn't seem to be specifically a big thing like in, in terms of... Not for me. Um, I mean, there's uh, probably as in every uh, company or every job, there's some some superstars, right, which, which lead the team and you have super talented uh, people that everyone looks up to. Um, but I wouldn't say that they typecast you into one specific thing. Okay, good to know. After Aladdin, there was episode nine. Uh, JJ is back <laughs> doing uh, Star Wars, the end of the Skywalker saga. And yeah, that's that's also, right? It was super, a super fun show and super huge for me. And um, also when, when I saw it in the cinema, it was actually quite emotional, not because of the movie in itself, but because it was such a big arc, right? From watching the movies and the prequel trilogy trilogy, and now being part of, of the end and then Star Wars uh, Skywalker saga is done. That was almost emotional. And uh, they really pushed that into the making of. If you watch the, the Blu-ray making of, it's, it's, it's like an end of an era and uh, they they get this point across really well. But um, again, it was was uh, Star Wars, so I was fully on board. Um, it was a, was a fun show. And I got to do lightsabers and a Millennium Falcon shot. So check. check. What else is there, basically, <laughs> as a compositor, is like lightsabers and Millennium Falcon. I mean, that's also one of the things I think, I'm not sure, like, I want to hear your opinion about it. You can love to work on something, but don't like the movie and you can like the movie but didn't like to work on it i think there's it's it's not not like it can be connected but to be honest most of the time i would say it is actually not really connected yeah um the the team and, and the work environment plays a huge role and for example uh, assassin's creed might not be the best movie ever but i, I had a ton of fun with the people i was sitting in the room at dna Right and the, the camaraderie and the soup and everything worked out really nicely. The end product, well, it's what the client wanted, not really what everyone else had in mind. But so so be it. And um, uh, if if everything comes together, uh, for example, on episode nine, right, we have a good team. You you like working in, and you you really enjoy the end product. That's even better. But a hundred percent, it's not. It's not a given. Just because you have an amazing shot and it was like fun to work on and it looks amazing, doesn't make a movie great. And that's also like the thing that's a, that people sometimes because I like um, as if you start to work on this level, you you notice how small your part actually is compared to the like like ninety minutes, hundred minutes to a, a movie basically. And you did some shots, maybe even your parts of the shot. And so your influence, I mean, it was maybe great and stuff like that, but it still doesn't make the movie, you know, it's still not the element that that creates like a fascinating, engaging movie at the end of the day. But I mean, that's the most important thing. I feel like, um, at least in my career, the, the, the more I grow, the more importance I, I set on the, on the team, on my own tasks, on all this kind of stuff that I have daily compared to the project itself, the a little bit, a little bit the company, and a little bit also the the credit. Like I never cared for that, to be honest, ever. Um, but it became less and less the longer, longer I I go through that. It's like I mean, especially for you after you get all the credits and and your bucket list is getting kind of getting very very thin. I feel probably the same for you too, isn't it? Yeah, the surrounding aspects get get more important basically right in the beginning i wanted to to work on the biggest the biggest shows and the biggest projects but um now i learned that uh, it's it's probably more important to have a good time and to enjoy what you're doing and uh, have a have a work life balance right don't work yourself to death just because you're 
28 frame shot uh, needs um, your weekend work something right uh, do what what you have to do to get it done but don't kill yourself it's a job up. as long as uh, jj abrams don't call you at night and says like carl i need this 28 frames tomorrow and you're like <laughs> okay 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 i mean that's that's an exception that's okay i, I understand <laughs> that one but anything else i feel like you're yeah, that's something that you should keep in mind one of the things that i uh I'm curious now um because I remember at the Film Academy, and I know a lot of people who are already professional um, starting out, they watch a lot of tutorials every day. Tutorials, 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 tutorials. practice, practice, practice. Is that something that you, um, because life balance also a little bit, is that something that you felt uh, you ramped down? I'm not talking about keeping up, you know, you can keep up in your work. I mean, I'm re really talking about this extensive amount of I don't know, two hours, three hours tutorials after work or something like that. Are you still doing that? It's it's rare. Definitely not a, as much as I used to in the beginning of my career, right? Which may, is also fair because at the end of the day, you're already working it. So it's not like you are kind of preparing yeah. for something uh, in this case. You should uh, know what you're doing, right? You, you need to know your software and to, you need to know what looks good and the, the workflows and stuff. But um, from, from time to time, if, if there's something new coming out, right, um, there's, there's training happening at the companies, but um, it's also a good idea to, to look into new aspects, like the whole machine learning stuff for Nuke now, it's pretty, pretty hot. Um, but at the Film Academy and, and uh, in the early stages of my career, tutorials were definitely a huge boost, but right now I would say I learn more from co-workers or like just doing it right you know what, yeah. what works <laughs> especially if you work in a company like ilm i mean you you kind of can guess that they will keep up with the current trend with usd and uh the new houdini tools and whatever uh or the new nuke elements and um that's also a little bit where you where you still can look it up but because that's one of the things I don't know, for me, it sounded horrible if I would think about the next 10 years, I would keep on going the same level of engagement to that, you know, like working eight hours, watching four hours tutorials, working eight hours, watching four hours tutorials. It doesn't sound like fun, to be honest. And especially if you grow, grow, grow up in your professional career, a kind of life, you become very laser focused. You, you're like, okay, what should I actually watch? Because I, I will not start to... I don't know, watch all the features that Nuke provides. What could be interesting, you kind of like skim through that and say, oh, this uh, neural network or what machine learning is interesting, I, I, I will explore that, but everything else. You skip the navigation part of the tutorial to learn yes. how to move the camera and uh, save a project. That's that's not what we're here to learn about, <laughs> get to the interesting stuff. Yeah. No, but it's, I feel, um, I feel like sure. it's important because uh, sometimes I, I have the feeling like even, even on the junior or student side, you can overdo it. I, I think I watched, to be honest, too, too many tutorials and in a in a bad way you know more of a consumption more of a i'm watching because i'm in the flow of watching and i want to learn more and get better and then i was just watching instead of really absorbing and practicing at the same time i think it became kind of like more tv um and it didn't feel healthy after a while at least because i, I remember i when i see uh like juniors and companies i see a lot of them like still like on the free time still watch uh, tutorials and stuff like that. I'm sometimes, sometimes it's maybe good just to take a pause, you know, it's Probably. life, like work life balance, basically kind of, because it, it is, it is a guarantee to burn, burn yourself out. If you're like work eight, 10 hours and then, uh, continue working basically. What was super new and interesting, um, was the whole stagecraft and led volume, uh, development right it, it was suddenly happening uh, and i think ilm played a played a big part in, in pushing that aspect of the industry forward and i first got in contact on the mandalorian season one and i think it's it's a big step for the whole industry right to cut down on on production time and uh, setup time on set uh, it adds pre-production but the actual shooting 
aspect will will be a lot faster and beneficial i would say and yeah we we worked on a couple led sequences and for a certain type of shot where you just have talking heads for example the dialogue scene cutting cutting between persons or something it's it's basically done you can almost use what what you get out of the camera if not use it straight from the camera so uh, mandalorian was uh, my first serial project right i've never worked on a tv show before only only movies and commercials so working on something episodic was was new to me as well during that time and um i i really like the show it's uh it's People Maybe. say, it, yeah, it got Star Wars back on track. Uh, while I enjoyed Episode Nine, um, the Mandalorian seemed fresh in, in its own aspects. Yeah. I know that that the volume they didn't all do everything in volume because that's something <laughs> people think of. Like uh, like a lot of things. I I was watching uh, again Hugo Garris. Uh, talk about that and he's like no 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 this is like a misconception um they did a lot also outside if they can do it outside they do it outside because uh, you know real light sunlight which is really hard with the volume because there's not enough like also power volume cannot mim mimic pure hardcore sunlight in a way um so how how much like how, how was your experience like working with that did you still had uh, blue screens or volumes or what, how was, was it mixed for you? So there were definitely blue screens. Um, I worked more on, on uh, set pieces that were not shot in the volume. I just had a couple of LED wall shots, so I can't speak a whole lot. But uh, those that I got to work on went pretty, pretty smoothly. But um, some of the, the biggest and, and major VFX shots are still either full CG, right, the, the space stuff, or on set um, in a build location or in a studio. Um, so it it will definitely not kill all the compositing and uh, CG artist jobs. That's that's for sure. It's also like very expensive, and as you mentioned, it you have to plan before, which not every company like Marvel uh, they don't like that to 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 know in in beforehand what they actually will be like what the movie will be they just shoot and then like let's see what what will happen in the edit basically how different was this uh format as you mentioned this first time on the series to film i think the biggest difference is that you have like staggered deadlines for each episode so um if I remember correctly, we didn't finish the whole thing and then hand it over to Disney Plus and say, here's the complete series, but we did it uh, like episode by episode. And you or I at least didn't work on every episode, but just selected parts of selected episodes. So uh, it was still uh, fun to watch, right? Because I didn't really know what's going on in between the episodes I worked on or even earlier. <laughs> um, in the episodes I did work on. But other than that, I think that the quality is pretty on par with feature film VFX. Just the time frame is shorter and you need to be more efficient in a, in a, some ways. Which, which is, is a kind of a combination between commercial and film. You could say so, yeah very fast turnaround and did you was that something because that's something i mean you work on something very longer and like a movie and it takes uh, much longer till the finished project is out or does it, does it feel different to this episode is finished we can ship we can work on different was it like a different feeling or is it the same thing basically um because i would you say can't go back <laughs> like, yeah I mean, that's that's the problem right um, if if in a feature film right uh, assets and, and, and uh, approaches uh, evolve over time and sometimes you go back to already finished shots and and approve them or update them and if the episodes are live on the air then well, good luck changing the look of the razor crest or something that's not gonna happen um, but other than that i would say it's it's still more or less the same pipeline uh, deadlines and then you move on to a new project which is just another episode looks similar but it's self-contained and now you kind of had the whole 
scape of from very small short to a full story a uh, solo story, basically Star Wars story, and now the Mandalorian series, which is regarded as one of the best Star Wars products in the last years, basically. What, what happened next for you? So I worked on Black Widow, another Marvel uh, show. Oh, yeah, just, which came out just recently. Yeah, after... just last week, I think. And it's, it's, been, it's been done for a while. So it was sitting on a shelf somewhere waiting for COVID to get better. <laughs> and... Um, uh, finally, finally hit the public. Um, I did a small Netflix movie as well, but the the big, big uh, show I was involved in is Jurassic World Dominion, the latest Jurassic World, which comes out next year. And this was arcing back all the way to the beginning, Jurassic Park, right? When I was frightened from the raptor scene. And um, I didn't work on any Raptor shots, sadly, but I did some other cool stuff and I could check off a dinosaur movie. So it's a Jurassic project of my bucket list. So I was, uh, say, I was pretty successful at ILM doing Star Wars, a lot of Star Wars, Transformers and Jurassic. So guys, if you want to watch all the leaked footage from Carl, um, I can like <laughs> watch till the end of the episode and then we can we can provide you with that one. Yeah. yeah. When a trailer drops some point in time, we can update the description with the link to the trailer. <laughs> That's an interesting thing because in, in a way, Jurassic Park was the catalyzator for you to, to go into this interest and then uh, Star Wars hit you basically and then you... You went your way and then Star Wars was the actual, the, the big thing that you wanted to work on, which you did. And then you still ended up on a, on a Jurassic, Jurassic World, Jurassic Park franchise, basically. So yeah. now all the bucket lists are like the whole bucket list is finished. So what's what's next, basically? What's uh, what's on the agenda? Another Star Wars film or what, what um, do you want to do? I wouldn't mind uh, working uh, on another Star Wars project. There are a couple of cool ones coming. Um, so I wouldn't say that uh, I'm done with Star Wars, but after Jurassic World, I switched from uh, ILM over to DNEC. So I returned to DNEC here in Vancouver, and I'm working on another video game based project. So let's see if we can break the curse this time around. <laughs> um, Which is the second one, isn't it? A video game movie? Uh, after after Assassin's, Creed. Uh, Assassin's Creed, yeah. Okay. So I worked on I worked on the intro for um, Forward Unto Dawn, a little Halo web mini series, if we want to count that um, as well. But it's uh, it's probably the biggest the biggest uh, computer game based movie I worked on so far. I mean, I would love to see Mass Effect, the uh, series probably. It doesn't make sense to make a movie because it was much too big. But like Mass Effect, the series, and it's well done. I would, that would be like uh, something I would really, really love. But I'm afraid, to be honest, more of it than, <laughs> <laughs> than I'm looking forward to it. Every couple of months or years, we get like a, a tiny glimpse of J.J. Abrams working on uh, a Portal movie or a Half-Life movie or something Valve related. So I am crossing my fingers for that one. I think that would be epic. That yeah, would be awesome. But again, this streak at the moment doesn't doesn't speak in the favor of that one. So cool. That's that's amazing. I feel like um, it ended up not uh, kind of we we uh, we are talking like um, the build up to Star Wars and then we talk about Star Wars itself. I feel like um, it's it's interesting to to um, have a specific dream uh, in your case, I know also a bucket list at the same time. And then like trying to, I mean, it was not like everything, it was still project came to you. You were pushing on things like Star Wars, but a lot of project just came to you for Nolan or stuff like that. This was not like by choice. It was just to get in the right uh, environment. I mean, if you work at, at Framestore, DNEC, ILM, um, it already by by chance you will work on something on something good and i feel if, if you as you mentioned if you if you push a little bit maybe maybe mention drop uh, at the at the at the bar it was like oh star wars <laughs> that would be nice kind of thing 10 times a day um <laughs> then, then then i feel like this is something where where you you 
end up as you did basically so it's it's kind of fascinating to to get into that it's important to be on really good terms with your artist manager and i'm not saying that i didn't drop uh, christopher nolan and uh, dunkirk a couple of times in the talks with my artist manager at dnx to, <laughs> to make that happen as well so you you basically yeah, you should make it very very subtle like for example you always have like a mark of yeah or shirt <laughs> or shirt and like pins and whatever and you basically like for each project that you want you have like a big shirt and mug collection at home and then every time you want to work on a specific franchise you just bring your Jurassic Park mug and your <laughs> and your uh Star Wars pin and stuff like that I think I feel like this this could help but you have to get into this environment and I I feel like what I really liked about this talk was kind of to emphasize on things that are important and things that are not. And to go really, really back, actually to the beginning, I, I really liked the first, uh, basically your application to the Film Academy, because I feel like this was something that kind of summarizes a little bit this uh, this thing, is kind of like be be super focused um, and make it, uh, be focused on one thing and make it really good. You know, don't try to to stretch your hands into, I want to work on all these projects and all these companies on all these positions on all this, da, 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 and I want to make the biggest movie in the world and da, 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 and da, da, da. No, you're like, you're doing one shot. For example, in this case, you are doing one shot. You were doing it really good and you were proud of it. Um, and, and that made the difference. And, uh, same thing you were, you were like, oh, so, something like Star Wars was your, basically your Mount Everest. You know, you, you were open for others, but that was kind of like something where you strived upon, like ILM for sure also. Um, and I feel like this kind of combination uh, with, all, with all the decisions you made, made it actually happen, to be honest. I mean, your decision to go to education, to go to the film academy and also kind of get into that, I feel also like made a huge boost into that. And um, your decision to keep in contact with ILM like throughout the years, you know, not just like hide every time and then wait until you're ready and then here, hire me kind of thing. Because that's something um, people sometimes don't understand that um, that you need to take your time with all this. And it's not just when you're ready, you will be suddenly like, oh, okay, uh, when I'm ready, I apply and then maybe I apply twice, three times and then um it it will be happening you know and that's that's actually not how how it works so i remember for example i was applying for digit pictures in in budapest for for years um and i had a contact with the recruiter for years and it took me three years of every half a year i was like oh i have a new showreel i have a new showreel and i noticed like it took me like three years until he even like oh, okay let's invite you to an interview um, and it was like a constant kind of, um, I'm here, you know, don't be annoying or something like that. Just let's, Hey, um, nice to meet you. Really cool. Um, if you're searching for a technical director, here's my show reel. Um, and then every half a year, if I have something to show, maybe like, Hey, I made a cool project I was proud of, or I made a new reel here. I dropped it. And he kept that. He, he, he I think like also through the history and whatever. And then three years later, suddenly he's like, let me invite you to an interview. And I'm pretty sure it was not just, if I would have applied without all this work before, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be the same chance because I feel like I was still a little bit on the edge of interested or not interested kind of situation. Yeah, um, be consistent, right? Don't be pushy, but stay in touch, right? Update them with your availability and your demo reels and don't be afraid to take a detour, right? If you don't, if your dream project or your dream company is not in reach right now, it doesn't mean you're not going to be there at some point, but maybe you need to be uh, somewhere else first or do a sidestep, right? Make the detour, but uh, keep it in mind and try to um, improve yourself, try to hone your skills. And I'm sure at some point you, you will get there. I would like to kind of wrap it up a little bit and, and get um, a little bit of a, a kind of a tips and tricks section. So um, since we're talking about compositor, that's the that's the section here. Um, what I would like to know is like, what would you focus on if you would start real compositing today? If you would say like, okay, I want to be a VFX compositor um, in the next years. Uh, I have no clue. I did like Photoshop and all this 
jazz and i know i i should probably learn nuke and stuff like that uh what 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 things would be would you be focusing on yeah the the, the basics get the get the software done right that's that's probably the most important but other than that i would try to understand light and composition and how how colors how the real world world works consume as much content as possible watch movies uh, watch films look at photographs go to the museum right have a visual library of stuff so when someone comes to you and say hey we need a lightning strike hitting a jedi tree you immediately <laughs> know uh, okay where did i see like a cool lightning and hitting an island and water reflections and how does that look right what makes it look cool and you're instantly like you know what i was watching lightning strikes for hours i know yeah. like <laughs> how they look like before i came even here yeah, you, you're talking to the right guy i'm the, I'm the lightning, <laughs> lightning guy um yeah and uh on the other hand if you see something where you feel something isn't right right you see a demo reel or a movie or VFX and you can say, well, this looks fake, this looks CG. Try to be precise and tell yourself why it isn't correct so you don't make the mistakes again, right? Are the black levels off? Is the defocus right? Is the lighting direction correct? And um, basically looking at a picture, at a frame and knowing what's going on, what needs to be better and what needs extra to be the the final 5% to be photorealistic, something like that. To expand on that, right? If you build your first compositing demo reel, don't try to make the biggest VFX shot ever. Don't look at Avengers and say, hey, the sequence when the alien worm crashes into New York City, that's something I want to build for my demo reel. Try to start in a, in a reasonably obtainable scope have something you could do probably on your own and do a simple task as good and as flawless as possible. I always say take a picture or video footage of your of your street, of your backyard, of your table and remove a parked car or remove your desk lamp and add a CG desk lamp. And if you can do that to perfection, it's 10 times more impressive than doing a half as alien spaceship explosion in a New York City stock footage frame from Google. That's actually one of the things I actually I remember I had this discussion when I, I was coaching people about like career and uh, they were asking they, a lot of times the, the biggest question is like, oh, I don't have the footage. I, I had this also with, with compositors. I'm not a compositor, but I can still kind of uh, provide uh, like coaching on that. When, and I was like, that doesn't really matter. Like, uh, I mean, it's the best case, of course, would be an amazing product, and it is in the in the in in the cinemas, cool. But if you don't have it, I mean, as you said, just take a camera. Just uh, you can uh, record some footage. I mean, a basic of recording should be like you know, I expect that from a compositor to be a little bit on the side of I know how I know how to record something. You know, you're not expecting like camera DOP or something. But um, and there's this thing that you basically mentioned is like. Oh, it's, it, it, it's not something impressive in terms of the, the picture or it's not like impressive for the other side. But as I feel like, as you mentioned, it's basically the same is like, it's not what they care about. You know, they know that you cannot have an alien ship ex exploding in whatever and everything looks like uh, done by someone who has 20 years of experience like five like a 10 people team or something um so what they basically as you mentioned uh actually looking into is compositing is integration especially in vfx it's about integration and so it is probably much much wiser to to make it really good and and as long as it's not crappy or something the, the footage just make it normal it looks good from your experience would you say like how, how often do you actually have cg compared to real work. I mean, you were you were, were working more on the CG environments also, but how often do you have like real environments with just uh, like a lamp or something that is suddenly integrated or overpainted? I say there's a fair amount of 2D only shots in, in every movie, right? In every Hollywood movie. I Maybe I'm uh, at a level now where I mostly work on CG, full CG or CG integration stuff, but don't underestimate the, just the cleanup the uh, 
patching of styrofoam cups on uh, tables in Game of Thrones, right? Something like this. This uh, happens all the time. Oh shit! We forgot our our coffee mug on the, on the dragon while like you know he's flying and there's like, a coffee mug. <laughs> <laughs> like, damn it! <laughs> Need to roll to paint it out. Yeah, but uh, as he said, getting getting very high seamless quality is uh, more important than an impressive visual. What I'm curious about is, is also, um, since we were talking, you are now the fire guy and the lighting guy and basically <laughs> the guy for this kind of things and set extension guy. Um, how important is, is specialization in compositing? Also as a beginner, um, in terms of two things. Uh, first one, specialization in terms of skill, you know, like roto and uh, mm. color and in integration and stuff. And second one of style, you know, like I'm the... Uh, Thor Ragnarok guy, you know, like saturated, crazy colors, animation style, or I'm the um, James Bond guy. I can do real uh, normal stuff, kind of like this too. <laughs> like how 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 important do you feel like this is important generally, but also for a beginner? I would say don't focus on any particular style, right? It's it totally based on the project you're working on and the client, and you need to be able to adapt right if if they want super saturated uh, over the top then you have to be able to do that and if they want to do seamless invisible vfx extensions you have to be able to do that as well so don't concentrate on any particular style it is feasible to to try to uh, concentrate on effects integration or um, maybe set extensions or or keying but I would say, especially as a beginner, it's important to show that you have a broad spectrum and you can do all of those things, right? Demonstrate a couple of keys, do some hair keys, right? Not, not the easy stuff. Show that you really understand how to, how to get those things done, right? <clears throat> CG integration, if you can't do it yourself, try to get a friend or um, a model from the internet that has some render passes and textures so you can play around with stuff like that but especially when you're starting out um, don't close the door to any aspect say well you're you're doing uh, a feature animation movie right uh, pixar style I'm, I'm not doing that i'm only doing the effects compositing i think that's not the right approach try to to be open and and get as much work done as possible yeah, because that's always the, the 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 struggle. I remember every time I was in FMX uh, on this on this recruiting booth. If you go to a small company, they were like more generalist. If you go to a big company, they always were like a specialist. Of course, you, know, you should be a compositor. You should be a TD, a rigger, or something like that, which is cool. But this was always also the question: like, how much should you be? Like, you know, like specialist in specialist. You know, like you are the set extension guy. You are the fire uh, inclusion or the effects inclusion guy or something like that. And I feel like there's, um, as you mentioned, I feel the same. If you can show something that you are really good in, you're super good in, in like extensions or effects uh, inclusion, I think that's super cool. But you, especially on the beginner level, um, especially on compositing, like, yeah, there's a very specific uh, expectation from you, you know, like Roto um, kind of thing. Keying is, is like the minimum of, of thing that you actually normally do if you're a junior in compositing. That's the, the beginner, beginner's guide, basically. Yeah, Roto prep, paint, right? Remove stuff, add stuff. That's probably like 60, 70% of what we do as a compositor. So what was the most important decision in your career? I feel like this is always something that helps to kind of reverse engineer it. If you think back on, on where you are now, like what was the thing that you felt pushed it um, the most for you that, that you had influence over? You know, if someone hires you and you, it's sometimes a little bit harder, but where you decided a specific thing, maybe you decided against something. One of them was to not stay in Germany. Right? I, I love the German industry and I, I know that the industry is growing, but to further my career, I think it was an important and necessary step to go to London and now go to Vancouver, right? It's it's VFX hubs for a reason. There's a lot of company, a lot of exchange, a lot of artists, and I think you have more opportunities um, 
for work and for work on projects you like to work on in those locations. What is the most proudest moment of your career? What would you say was the thing? I mean, we talked so much about Star Wars. So the question is, is it Star Wars? Was there something about that? Hmm. Star Wars is definitely up there, right? I always wanted to do it. And <laughs> But we're talking it. about the, the, the number uno. Let's talk about number tres. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was super proud when uh, one of my Star Trek shots was selected as the favorite of the VFX soup on that project, right? When the show was wrapping up and finishing, the, the soups and the client picked a couple of shots they really liked. And uh, mine was picked, which was a full CG uh, explosion shot with the Enterprise in it. And um, that was, was huge for me back then. Uh, and um, obviously my lightning strike, right? that was huge. <laughs> yeah, of course. And um, super proud. I can't say I was not proud of receiving the VFS award, right? That was another big one. Especially since you didn't have to, to do the speech. <laughs> maybe I should have done the speech. But... Maybe that would be then definitely number uno, you know, like that would be the thing. So uh, would you do anything different if you think back on your career so far? I mean, it's still going. It's not like you are, you are at the end. But um, from, from what you did before, what did you, you say? Okay, that, that decision took longer because I did it this way. I, if I would have decided a different direction, it would be much easier faster i would get in the film academy in the first try <laughs> <laughs> i don't think that was your decision at the end uh, of the day um, was it? but i mean you basically you meant like um you wouldn't have you would have done it the same way you did it the second time like super focused and not yeah. influenced by yeah. by other voices not too many cooks right it's the the saying is there for a reason try to especially when you're in control and you have a vision of how something would be or should be Don't let a lot of people try to distract you from that past. I think it's also, in a way, I feel like uh, that's what, one of the things that the Film Academy actually wants to teach you, uh, in a way of like declining, because I know a lot of people apply multiple times. And when they get there, it's a lot of times they, they just kind of say, like, you missed the experience. I mean, the same thing with a lot of companies, especially the big ones. They're like, you're not here. You're not, you missed still something. And you know, hopefully it motivates you to to push Keep to pushing, get to yeah. this level to get to this level but i have to say one thing i absolutely hate the the emails that you, that you get from 99 of the company if you get one i hate them all it's like it's the worst emails i i, I don't even know they they have some billion dollar companies and they cannot spend i don't know an afternoon on writing an email where you, when you get it and you get declined for your job you feel like okay i understand Let's move on. I don't mean afternoon for each uh, each candidate. I mean like a template because a lot of them are like, yeah, we looked at your we looked at your stuff basically, and we we have so many candidates. Uh, we are sorry that you cannot be. Uh, we, we didn't pick you for the next round, uh, but try again next time. And it's like, I don't know. It feels like completely a lot of. Sometimes it feels like demotivating to be honest, uh, more than motivating. It's a tough position and a tough email to write right if you and, and you have a lot of candidates so yeah but that's what i mean like one really great template where you feel like there is there's somebody spend some time and it. it's not machine learning generated email that is kind of like here and it's, i mean it's not like they're specialized to you 99 it's always the the template email if you're if you're lucky your name is at the top Uh, so basically that's the thing um do you have any final tips so if you if you would strive to a career maybe someone wants to work also on star wars but <laughs> specifically on on compositing maybe ilm and all these interesting companies is there something that you would say that's something i really would advise you be a team player right uh, it's It's really important to take criticism well and be able to separate that from your own artistic mind, right? You have an idea how a shot should look like, but if your supervisor or the client has a different idea, then don't take it too personal, right? <laughs> Just they literally pay you to do what they want you to do. Try to be proactive. Right. Don't wait for someone to tell you something obvious. Right. If you know that your edges aren't 
crazy good or the lighting direction is wrong, try to flag that, own your shot, talk to the other artists involved, talk to your lighting guy and talk to your effects artist, right? Try to work as a team, again, be a team player, build your visual library, but we talked about that before. Try to network, right? Who knows which of your friend ends up as the CEO of your dream company at some point, right? Definitely, definitely go to the bars after work. That's uh, something for some people. It's, it's, I mean, again, like it sounds, sounds weird to recommend that kind of thing, but it is actually the thing that some people, you know, have their own minds. Maybe they have their, their spouse and a family or something like that. And they're like, okay, working, going home. But especially in the beginning, especially in, in if you're new to a company or a location, I think this is something you, you should never do is kind of like uh, not attend to like all the past company activities, especially in the beginning, just to, to set yourself up, as you mentioned, to, to, cre to, to create a little bit of, because a lot of times the, the, the banter that you get through the work is sometimes not enough because you don't have the same opportunities as you have in a bar or with a drink. It helps everyone get, get used to one each other, right? If you, if you know someone a little bit closer, you trust them more and you know their strengths and weaknesses and it, it makes everything easier, right? And it's not Hopefully. only your leads and soups, it's the guy sitting next to you. And it also helps you with the criticism, as you mentioned, uh, basically, because I notice if a lot of times I, I sometimes some people are a little bit harder on the surface and if you don't know them, they're, they come like, you know, like with punching you, literally coming like, this looks like shit. You know, like in a way, and, and like maybe just the tone or something like that. And then you're like, mm. and then if you if you talk with them, maybe you have a beer with them, whatever. You you know you know exactly who they are. You know they maybe hopefully they're not as hard as they they seem to be, but that's their way of communication or criticism or something like that. And then you can literally, I notice sometimes that I lit literally shifted and suddenly we're like, I know that this is how how he or she talks. That's why. So, but before that, I was kind of like, can you? Yeah. Talk completely like a little bit different with me about that is like not sort of the nicest way um so it comes back to all this basically that you said it's a combination it gives them a chance to adjust to you as well right if they know that someone is uh, taking critique in another way or you have to adjust your the way you say the totally. things right it, it gives them the opportunity to do so as well how important would you say is um, scripting for that? Because I mean, I'm, I'm teaching Python. That's that's a question I basically have to ask just by by uh, by professionalism. So how do you th how how important do you think is Python as a compositor, generally speaking? It's not a necessity, but it definitely helps. Right? It it gives you an extra edge uh, when it comes to hiring. Right? If I have two people at the same level and one knows Python and the other doesn't, I you would have definitely have the leg up in that case. And um, I really enjoy it. And it helps me get some repetitive tasks out of the way or just be more productive. And it's always a good thing. But don't feel like you have to be the perfect programming god to be a good compositor. That's, that's not the case. One of the things that I, I always like to end the show is to get a little bit to know you since we were talking about basically, I mean, Basically, what we need is like two beer, and then we can do the final questions here. <laughs> so we can we can. Dip. Um, what I'm curious about is a little bit of your personality, and uh, because I always feel like it's it's a good thing to to understand who's the person. Basically, what we talked about in the bar thing. So I would like to ask you some some quick uh, question, which are a little bit more for you than than you as a compositor. So first thing is like biggest inspiration, living, dead, or fictional. That's a tough one. Um... George Lucas. No. <laughs> <laughs> not, the, not the biggest. He's definitely an inspiration. Um, but... The second raptor on Jurassic Park. I, I would say uh, my, my granddad, right? He, he was a painter himself uh, with oil on canvas, like super traditional. And he always pushed me to be more creative and do more creative things. So he was uh, instrumental in getting me where I am today. Um, I would say that's, that's a huge inspiration, or he was a huge inspiration for me. Other than that, um, there's a couple of filmmakers that are really cool, right? Um, Yoda is obviously a big inspiration, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's, that's neatly to our next, uh, so my next question is like, what's your favorite quote? 
I mean, now it's like it, it has to be. Given... May the force be with you. It, it just <laughs> okay. has to be. <laughs> okay, now we go. We're going back. Okay, that's good. Um, favorite movie. Um, I probably have to say it's The Empire Strikes Back at the very top. I think it's the best Star Wars movie. Uh, I like I'm not, aliens. I'm not sure how much he's pressured now about like answering every <laughs> Star, Star Wars. Wars. <laughs> <laughs> I like Aliens. It's a great movie. Oh, um, yeah. One pick. One, only one. Only one. Oh, then uh, it's The Empire Strikes Back. Sorry. Okay. Sorry to be Star Wars again. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite place to live? I have to check out more places. Uh, I've not been to all my, my uh, vacation bucket list, right? That's a whole different list. Um, right now, I'm really enjoying Vancouver. Uh, but I, I could imagine going to Singapore for, for a while, right? I've never been, so I can't exactly say it's my favorite place to be, but I want to check it out. Um, but right now, I'm super happy in Vancouver and lock in Vancouver as my final answer. Okay. Um, one thing that you cannot live without? Coffee. It's, uh, <laughs> it has to be around me somewhere. What's your hidden talent? Also a tough question. Um, let's, let's say it's not a hidden talent. It's more of a fun fact. But uh, I'm right-handed and I brush my teeth with my left hand. And, and do like shoelaces with my left hand. And I some, mean, in, in a way, it's a hidden talent because some people cannot do the switcheroo. So <laughs> in a way, that's, that's, that's makes it makes it fine. Um, what, so how far would you succeed in who wants to be a millionaire? But the normal one, not Star Wars or something. Just, <laughs> a, just a regular. The, the German one is okay too. It doesn't have to be a, a Canadian one. I have better chances in a Star Wars who would be a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, I'm say. for sure that that um, so at least question three, because I have three jokers, right? So okay. <laughs> that's, that's, and, <laughs> and who would be your phone joker? Um, I would say my my sister. He, she she uh, is a PhD and super smart and knows a lot of things I don't. So I would call her. One thing that you would like to do before you die. So any minute now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe not uh, that fast, but. Um, on top I would of your like bucket to, list, basically. I, I would like to get a pilot license at some point. Mm. I think that's that's a really cool thing. To a small, have. like, motoric machine, like you don't want to fly a a big plane. Uh, I'm, yeah, I probably will never fly uh, like an Airbus <laughs> or something. But <laughs> Boy, it's Boeing. The, it's the first step again, right? Set you go yeah, and okay, then okay, do okay, the steps okay. to get there. Or maybe space, maybe go to space. I mean, if you have the money, it's possible. As we know by now, anyone <laughs> with enough money can go to space. That's combining with uh, who wants to be a millionaire. Maybe you can combine that too. And then how many times do I have to win to finance? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. I think a one time will not be enough for, for any space travel. So yeah. So the last question, most important, of course, also, what alternative career would you aspire to if it wouldn't be compositor in visual effects? Um, I would say I would go for uh, chef F food and cooking uh, I, I like that a lot I'm not the best at it but if I would pick that <laughs> as my alternative path I would probably be better a specific cuisine uh, I, I really enjoy Thai food but um, I'm probably not the best Thai cook that's for sure. But uh, as you said, it's an alternate reality where I'm super good <laughs> at Thai food cooking. So that's the case. I think I remember we had this discussion is like um, compositing and compositing a dish uh, is kind of it has this, this there are elements of similarity yeah. kind of, you know, like it's uh, got a lot of parallels, right? You have your ingredients and uh, upstream departments of cutting and preparing <laughs> stuff and then you combine it into uh Pi pipelines are everywhere basically yeah <laughs> cool um thank you very much uh, i really really enjoyed this conversation and it, i feel i feel like it gave us a little bit of a look into uh, first one like uh of course into how it is to really achieve like a goal of like working on star wars hopefully it also gave the audience a little bit of of a look into how it is to work on star wars um, but also a little bit what i wanted to to get out of this is a little bit also the understanding of what it means to be a compositor in visual effects on the on the highest level, basically, 
which uh, I, I really, yeah, you, you achieved, and I, I really looking forward what's what's next for you. Oh, um, thanks for having me. It was a great time. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to seeing the final result with all the <laughs> graphics and well, all the yeah, all this extra extra stuff and explosions and uh, intercuttings <laughs> and stuff like that. Sure. That's it with this week's episode of the 21 Artist Show. Thank you so much for watching and listening. This podcast is 100% ad-free. And to keep it that way, check out my website, 21artistshow.com. There you can find exclusive access to awesome masterclasses and coaching opportunities to work successfully in visual effects, animation, and games. Just go to 21artistshow.com. And don't forget to share it with people who would benefit from that content and tell them they're awesome. See you on the next episode. Sensei! Sensei! Okay,